I don't know if you're aware, but for every dementia researcher, there's something like four or five cancer researchers. So oh. if we want to make the kind of progress that cancer has made in the last couple of decades, we need a lot more people to join this race. Silver Adventures is a content and technology company dedicated to improving the lives of older adults through immersive virtual reality experiences. And this podcast is our opportunity to hear from industry experts, thought leaders, and passionate individuals to share with you their knowledge, expertise, and experiences. Welcome to the Age Care Enrichment Podcast. I'm your host, Ash Deneef, and welcome back to Season 2. We're kicking off the season with a bang as we have three guests for this first episode, and they're all here on behalf of Race Against Dementia, Sir Jackie Stewart's charity helping kickstart dementia research across the globe. Joining us today is Penny Moyle, the CEO of Race Against Dementia. She spent over 20 years working in the field of business psychology and has been working with Race Against Dementia, or RAD, since 2018. Penny's on the program today to share a bit about her story, about RAD's mission, and introduce two new postdoctoral fellows whose research has been funded by Race Against Dementia and Dementia Australia. Those fellows are Dr. Kunle Badamosi, who's researching the physical changes to the brain caused by frontotemporal dementia, and Dr. Andrew McKinnon, who's investigating the relationship between sleep and the onset of dementia. That's a very basic overview, but Kunle and Andrew will both go into much more detail about the specifics of their research and what it could mean for the future of dementia treatment and prevention. It's a jam-packed episode, so I hope you enjoy this conversation with Penny Moyle, Dr. Kunle Badamosi, and Dr. Andrew McKinnon. Penny, thank you so much for joining us today on the podcast. Thanks very much for having me, Ash. Can we start uh, with a little bit about your background and how you came to work with Race Against Dementia? Sure. So my background is actually as a business psychologist. That was, I guess, my my first career. Um, I worked uh, in that area for nearly 20 years and only latterly have come to working in a dementia charity. That came about because the company I was working for was sold at the end of 2016. So I was looking for a new challenge and something meaningful to do. And I was talking to a colleague who happened to be a headhunter and was also involved in the dementia world. And she said to me, have you ever thought about working for a charity? And I went, well, that could be interesting. And she introduced me to Sir Jackie and my life changed. Fantastic. So you had no experience of working with a charity before Race Against Dementia? No experience of working for a charity, but experience of being a CEO and managing a a medium-sized business. We had about 200 employees. So the biggest change for me is that I went from managing about 150 to 200 employees to being myself and one other person. Wow, that is a big change. And um, Was there much of a difference between working for a for-profit company as opposed to working for a charity? I think your know, charities have different rules and regulations. So that was a whole new learning for me. There was also just learning about the dementia world, about the disease, about the science, about the sort of global statistics and all that kind of stuff. So that was new content, I guess. But I think for me, the biggest thing was going from having, you know, a marketing team to do marketing for me to going, oh, I I do everything. That's interesting. (laughs) I go from writing strategy, meeting with trustees, meeting with potential donors, Uh, some of whom are quite famous people, to, you know, writing website content and making sure the bills are paid. So it's got an enormous breadth to it, which is quite fun. Mm, Absolutely. And now we'll talk a bit more about Race Against Dementia in a moment, but you mentioned that when you started working, you needed to kind of skill up and and learn a lot about dementia and the field and, and the state of things. What was that process like? Well, one of the great things was that this headhunter that I referenced has also written a book about dementia. She said she, when her mother was diagnosed with dementia, she wished there'd been a book to give her that introduction. So after her mother sadly passed away, she wrote that book. Um, So that was my initial introduction. I also very quickly, once I started working for Race Against Dementia, was able to hook into the network that Sir Jackie had already created because he'd already been on a bit of a dementia journey for the previous year or so. 
So I was very quickly talking to professors around the world about their view of dementia and what they recommended I should learn about. So that was a you know, huge leg up into the area. Also, there were connections in with other dementia charities because actually connecting in with other dementia charities and working on a partnership model has been very big for us. Mm -hmm. So we'll shortly talk about Dementia Australia. But the, in my initial phase, it was Alzheimer's Research UK um, and meeting the people there sort of gave me a grounding in everything I needed to know about dementia, but actually also about running a dementia charity. And we work quite closely together with them. Fantastic. And Race Against Dementia has somewhat of a re reputation for being involved with cutting edge research, right? So you, you would have been involved with some of the most recent and exciting discoveries within dementia research. Yeah, I mean, I think so Jackie's sort of reason to start up Race Against Dementia is he just felt that all the effort that has been put in so far clearly hasn't given us any disease modifying treatments. And that, of course, was a huge disappointment for the whole Stewart family when Lady Helen Stewart was diagnosed, that there weren't treatments um, that they could try out or do anything with. So, so Jackie really wanted to change that. And so that sort of led into this idea of we need to do things differently. We're looking for greater level of innovation. And what is it that we can do that might really make a difference? And particularly landed on the idea that we want to invest in early career researchers. We need to get new blood into this system. Um, we also just need more researchers in the system. I don't know if you're aware, but for every dementia researcher, there's something like four or five cancer researchers. So wow. if we want to make the kind of progress that cancer has made in the last couple of decades, we need a lot more people to join this race. So what are some of the programs that Race Against Dementia is running to get that timing? So the main thing we run is the Race Against Dementia postdoctoral fellowship program. Uh, we're a small charity, we're fairly new, so the numbers are not going to sound all that exciting, but we need to punch above our weight. Mm. In our first round of funding, we appointed three postdoctoral fellows in collaboration with Alzheimer's Research UK. Then we fairly quickly appointed one at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. Mm -hmm. So we have those four who've been in place for over a year now, and they're quite geographically dispersed. So we have one who's currently in Florida, who will be moving to UCL in London uh, later this year. We have another who is attached to the Mayo Clinic in Minnesota, but is currently actually in Amsterdam. Uh, she couldn't travel over last year when she'd expected to do that travel, due to all mm -hmm. the reasons we all are very familiar with. Uh, we have one in Scotland at the University of Edinburgh, and we have one in uh, Cambridge uh, in the UK. So we've already got a reasonable uh, sort of geographical coverage, despite having only four in place. It must be quite exciting to have this be a worldwide, worldwide endeavour. Is that always been part of the goal with the fellowship program? Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, when I first met Sir Jackie, I said, you know, what was important to him? And he was like, well, speed and urgency, youth, as he likes to call anybody under 50, and global was always part of the, the deal. So one of the reasons we're talking today is that we're appointing two new fellows we're announcing just this week, uh, both of whom are in Australia. Fantastic. And by the time this episode comes out, they will have been announced, but we're very lucky to have them here with us on the podcast. Uh, Penny, would you like to introduce our guest for today? Yes. So I'm really excited to welcome Andrew McKinnon and Kunle Badamosi, uh, each of them postdoctoral researchers, Andrew in Sydney, uh, Kunle in Queensland, University of Queensland. Um, but it's probably better that they talk about their own research than me try to paraphrase. <laughs> Fantastic. Welcome to you both, Andrew and Kunle. Thank you. Thanks, Ash. Appreciate you having us here. Kunle, congratulations for uh, for receiving the the fellowship. What does this uh, What does this grant mean for you? Oh, um, thanks, Ash. Um, indeed, um, first I'll say it's come with a lot of excitement, you know, and anticipation. Um, I remember receiving the news for the grant late in December, and it was a, just a perfect way to end the year, you know, after the whole way 2020 went it was sort of the highlight of 2020 for me was the day i got the news and it gives me lots of you know opportunities one is that i'm able to continue to do what i actually love doing which is actually asking scientifically relevant questions not just scientifically relevant but also uh, questions that are relevant for the society 
and we know the impacts dementia has on people around us, not just in terms of the numbers, um, but also in terms of the cost, the emotional cost, the financial cost, you know. And in many ways, I see myself as being well positioned by this postdoctoral fellowship from Race Against Dementia in partnership with um, Dementia Australia Research Foundation Fellowship positions me to be in this place to be able to answer these um, major questions in the field of dementia. Um, and I think that's perfectly linked on so it gives me the opportunity to work um, in this environment where I have the best people in the field um, of dementia here in Queensland, who also collaborate with other people all around the world. So, so it essentially builds my network, ensures I'm able to help society and actually and keep doing what I actually love doing, which has always been a motto for me that I have to really enjoy what I'm doing and the questions I'm asking, the things I'm looking forward to, you know, to asking and finding solutions to them. Yeah. Fantastic. And I had a, a brief look at your the research that you're proposing and it's way above my my knowledge. Can you give us a, a little overview of, of what it is that you're going to be, the questions that you're going to be asking? Okay, so, so, so specifically, uh, I'm looking at um, questions on dementia, but not just any type of dementia, but specifically the type called the frontotemporal dementia. Mm -hmm. And this is a type which um, so I think is the second most leading cause of dementia in people who are just under 65 who live with any type of dementia. And a key feature is that actually in, in these people, you have a loss of specific parts of the brain. That's the frontal part of the brain and the temporal part of the brain, hence the name frontal temporal dementia. In normal conditions, they control your mood, your social behavior, your personality, language, and, and speech is generally. So when the spot starts to sort of get compromised and undergoes a deterioration, we have a sudden onset of change in behavior, change in speech patterns, change in mood. And so my question sort of comes in into exactly what we have in Ukraine at the moment. As Penny mentioned earlier, there's at the moment no cure. There's actually no treatment, no drug to therapy at all for, for, for temporal dementia. And the big question is um, why? And the answer is simple. We don't know what causes FTD. But one thing we know is that there's certain proteins in the body um, which function properly. Well, when functioning properly, keeps the body in good health. But in FTD or in frontotemporal dementia, what happens is that this protein starts to plump up. So you can imagine, you know, what should be one suddenly becomes like 100 all in one small space. So these proteins essentially clump up. And that makes things very difficult for the brain because when they clump up, ultimately they become very toxic to the brain. And essentially that's what leads to the brain parts and the frontal parts and temporal parts dying. So here's what my research is about. My research involves actually looking at those proteins. Now, these proteins, we've known, we've known for a while that they clump, but we've never seen them before. So, so I make use of what we call advanced imaging tools. Um, they are these sort of imaging tools that have almost about 10 million times the magnification that of a standard digital camera. So it means I can actually zoom in in very great details to see these proteins. And all I want to ask is simple. What happens to these proteins before the clump? what happens while they're clumping and what happens after they've clumped. And that's just um, one of the key parts of my research questions. Yeah, amazing. So it sounds like if you can get some sort of understanding of where they come from, what they're doing, where they're going, maybe you can understand one of the causes that's leading to FTD. Exactly. Wow. And then perhaps if we're lucky, leading to a treatment, if we can understand how to deal with these protein clumps. Yes, and, and that's the second part of my research where, um, so the body actually has a way to deal with these things naturally. It has something which is like a waste disposal machinery that either recycles or actually just destroys the clumps. But in FTD, this machinery is compromised. So the second part, which um, perfectly um, leads on to, you know, thinking of therapeutic strategies will be for me to look at this machinery that is compromised and see what drugs actually could help this machinery to keep on working in recycling or degrading this protein clumps, which should not um, should not be in the body. Yep. Great. Now, circling back to what Penny said before about trying to bring people into the field of dementia research, is your background in dementia research, or are you just newly in the field? Well, I'd say not brand new, but I'm still like about three years in, into the field of dementia. So my research, my doctorate was all about understanding how general anesthetics work. And I was using these advanced imaging tools and I was able to get with these very noble, nice answers to how drugs like propofol and etomidate and isoflurane work during surgery. And that's led me on to move to Belgium where I was introduced to the field of Parkinson's disease, and that was my introduction to dementia field. And as we know, Parkinson's disease is the second leading cause, you know, of dementia after Alzheimer's. And so there I started to sort of understand the premotor symptoms 
that's occurring Parkinson's where 20 or 30 years before people have symptoms such as sleep fragmentation, um, loss of smell, way before any motor symptoms start. And my investigation was focused on that. And essentially what I'm doing now in FTD research is I'm taking my skill from my PhD, where I've looked at this advanced imaging tool, as well as my experience with dementia and Parkinson's disease and using it to answer a question on prototemporal dementia. That's great. And Penny, that must be a, a really nice, Kunle's research must be a nice example of being able to take skilled individuals who have, you know, a know-how and experience in a different field and, and then bringing them into dementia research. Absolutely. And I think, you know, not only does that you know help with the numbers game of just bringing more people into the dementia research space, but it's that thing of thinking differently, bringing people who've been thinking about something else and how do they apply that to the problem of dementia. So yeah, perfect example. Now, Andrew, uh, congratulations as well. You've also received this postdoctorate fellowship. Yeah, thank you. It's been an absolute pleasure. I'm really grateful and very excited to join the team. I do Sir Jackie's sort of vision to apply the high performance elements of F1 to dementia research, I find is a particularly intriguing approach, which may hopefully ultimately streamline dementia research and allow the breakthroughs to be made at a more rapid pace. What I particularly like about this fellowship and a long, long time ago in another life, I, w- I did a business degree. Uh, so I come from a business background in marketing management. And further on, I went on to psychology and, and cognitive neuroscience. But I can see the parallels and I can see that there's, a, there's great potential there for, for, for the two to be combined. And I think that we're very fortunate in receiving these fellowships that we're going to be able to engage with minds not just in academia, but across industry, external stakeholders, policymakers, and so on. Because I think this is going to be very helpful, not just in sort of disseminating the importance, but also allowing for integration of expert knowledge across a diverse number of fields to to move dementia research forward. Maybe it's a case of whilst there are other postdoctorate fellowships out there, this is somewhat smart money because it's connecting you to, to really high powered people in this field of research. And, and so Jackie's personal, you know, his motivation to really tackle this problem head on. It's great. You're listening to the Age Care Enrichment Podcast, brought to you by Silver Adventures. We're on a mission to examine ways to improve the quality of care and the quality of life for seniors. And each week, we're bringing age care industry experts, thought leaders, and passionate individuals directly to you to share their knowledge, stories, and experiences. In season one of the podcast, we delivered thought-provoking and meaningful episodes covering consumer experience, dementia care, palliative care, service transformation, and research and innovation. And we've got plenty more amazing guests lined up for season two. So maybe you'd like to partner with us and have your message showcased directly to our rapidly growing audience of aged care executives and people working within the industry. For advertising inquiries, please email acepodcast at silver, that's S-I-L-V-R, adventures.com.au. Now let's get back to this week's guest. Now the research that you're undertaking, I think, is to do with sleep and the connection with the onset and progression of dementia. Is that correct? That's correct, yes. Can you give us a bit of an overview that's a bit more detailed than my summary? What we know so far is that sleep plays a vital role in the maintenance of key brain processes. So pretty recent research the last couple of years have identified the lymphatic system, which seems to clear amyloid beta, one of the pathogenic biomarkers related to Alzheimer's disease during sleep. Um, and the sleep-wake cycle regulates this clearance of the brain's lymphatic system. So it happens much more during sleep than when you're awake. This accumulation also occurs far prior to the manifestation of any sort of cognitive decline that you can detect on testing. And I'm also an endorsed clinical neuropsychologist, so I'm sort of at both ends of this. And And I'm very much interested in the translational aspects of how you can bring cognitive neuroscience through and into the clinic in meaningful ways. So um, when we talk about sleep disturbances, we're talking about things like sleep quality, sleep fragmentation, misalignment of um, sleep period timing. So basically circadian rhythm changes, so alterations in melatonin secretion, which tend to be associated with one and a half times higher risk for developing Alzheimer's disease. And also sleep-wake disturbances themselves are known to impair the formation of new neurons in the brain, which in areas that are very important for memory consolidation. And so this is kind of key bi-directional relationship between sleep-wake disturbances and neurodegeneration. And that's kind of where I come into it. So 
So the vast majority of dementia cases are either Alzheimer's or Alzheimer's with vascular dementia pathology. Um, they often go hand in hand. Uh, around about a third of dementia cases are believed to be preventable due to modifiable risk factors that start accumulating from mid-age. So things like hypertension, episodes of depression, lifestyle factors like smoking, excess alcohol intake, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And we believe that sleep also has the potential to be a target, uh, a target as a modifiable risk factor. It's just that thus far, a lot of the studies have been cross-sectional, so one time point, and we haven't had the longitudinal data to make a strong case yet for sleep to be added to the list of um, known modifiable risk factors. But it's certainly linked to dementia onset. I mean, during my, my PhD, I did a lot of work on those with what we call mild cognitive impairment, which is an at-risk stage between normal, healthy cognitive ageing and dementia, where about 45% of people will convert to dementia within five years. Um, and we looked at those with MCI and sleep disturbances versus those with MCI and no sleep disturbances and found reduced connectivity in brain networks uh, in areas that are specific to things like memory consolidation. So it seems quite apparent that sleep has an important role to play. And the main aim of my research for this particular fellowship is to to look into that further and provide a stronger evidence base for it to become officially recognised as a modifiable risk factor for dementia. Fantastic. So you mentioned the longitudinal study there. Is that something you're able to undertake with this fellowship? Yes. Yeah, so effectively what we're doing is in an older adult cohort that are at risk for or in the early stages of dementia, we're going to be measuring, measuring them at two time points, so year one and year three. And we're going to use actigraphy, so sort of wrist-worn actigraphy, and also finger-worn oximetry. And that sort of measures things um, like oxygen desaturation, which is often seen in a very common sleep disorder of obstructive sleep apnea. Um, and so the constant sort of starting and stopping of breathing throughout the night disrupts the flow of oxygenated blood to the brain, increases your risk for, for dementia. And then because I am very interested in the translational element, the second part of it is to develop and validate tools using machine learning uh, from all the data that we collect from the first aim to produce weighted risk composites that will, can produce clinical reports, individualised clinical reports, I should say, for clinicians to use in clinic that can say, given that you are at this level on these particular variables, this confers 20% risk for cognitive decline over the next three years. And then they can go about addressing whether it's treating hypertension or getting involved in exercise programs, or whatever, because as stated before, there are no curative treatments for dementia. So the earlier we can detect these changes in cognition, the earlier we can start intervening and hopefully have a preventative approach. Fantastic. So maybe in a few years' time, if the research proceeds in a successful way, we, we might find wearables paired with this sort of data to provide modelling and, and monitoring for an advanced screening. Is that right? That's one possible outcome, absolutely, yeah. Fantastic. Well, Penny, th this is also another great example of a piece of research that can really uh, really change the way that dementia is, is viewed and is treated. Yeah, and I love the idea that it gives us something positive that all of us can be doing, um, thinking about prevention and, or at least reducing our risk factors. So you know, sleep is something that we all need um, and this is just another reason why it's so important and we should be paying attention to our own sleep patterns and it could add into the other modifiable risk factors that we already know about, um, which I usually summarise as anything that's good for your heart is good for your brain. And we tend to know what's good for our hearts, you know, eat well, exercise, all of those kinds of things. It sounds a bit dull, but I think the benefits are so worthwhile. <laughs> yeah, I'd rather be dull and healthy. You know, we are living longer. But the, the dream was never that we lived a long time and spent our final years with dementia. The dream is to live long and healthy. And I think an important thing to note, sorry to, to drop, jump in, I just forgot to mention that a lot of these, these risk factors um, start to accumulate from approximately midlife. So the earlier you get onto them, the greater the chance of prevention later on. Yeah, that, this is where that longitudinal study is really coming into play here and we can, we can start getting data earlier and earlier. So uh, anyone feel free to jump in on this question, but this was possible also through Dementia Australia's partnership with Race Against Dementia. What was the, the application process like? Kunle or Andrew, if you want to lead here. Okay, maybe I'll start. So um, as I mentioned, I, was, I got some experience working in Parkinson's disease in Belgium, and I moved back to Australia right in the middle of COVID. Um, I arrived in Australia on the 31st of July, 
um, to start a sort of one-year contract or less about nine months contract. And I remember talking with my current um, boss, um, Adam Walker, about potential fellowships to apply for. And it was like, oh, there's actually a fellowship to apply for, which is due in three weeks' time. So I was right in the middle of the, my hotel where I was reading up on frontotemporal dementia um, uh, while I was in the quarantine and I was writing. I knew a lot of, a lot about it, but then to sort of come up with a project and to come up with a research questions, my aims, my milestones, and essentially write it all, get feedback, and actually go, go through the whole submission process. It was indeed, you know, pretty surprised I could get this done, you know, in, in a short while of about three weeks, which for me was a great experience because I previously had experience writing, uh, applying for a fellowship and writing within a short time interval as well. So, so that was great. And I think I especially loved the interview um, component where after we were selected, a couple of us had to be interviewed. I really enjoyed that because it gave me the opportunity to interact, not just in the context of trying to to defend or um, my research questions, but also just to you know put it out there and get the feeling from others as to how excited other people could be about what I'm also excited about. So the whole process from writing to actually getting um, a positive response was very, very great for me. Penny, can you jump in here and, and give us an idea of what you were looking for in these interviews? So I think we look at essentially three things. We're looking for the right person, so we're looking for people who, you know, have demonstrated that they are, you know, brilliant at science. We're looking for them to have an exciting and innovative project. That was not what Quinlay was busy working on while in quarantine. I love that he made great use of that period of isolation. And then we're wanting to make sure they're in the right place, that they're in an institution that can support the particular project that they're working on. So that's kind of what happens, I guess, in the written review process. And I'm not sure if we said, but we had over 40 applications for these two positions. So there was quite a lot of work that went into the pre-interview stage of working out who met the criteria of those sort of three areas. And then in the interview, we are looking for that kind of spark of something different and, and engagement in this idea of connection with Formula One. So we haven't talked much yet about that connection, but each of the research fellows in our program get connected with uh, Formula One at least at a high level, but they also have a mentor who are either in Formula One or some other kind of high-tech commercial enterprise, just to give some sense of ways of doing things differently and particularly ways of doing things more quickly and in a more streamlined way. So that was something we could talk about a bit in interview and gauge, you know, to make sure really that any prospective fellow knew what they were signing up to. What they will get is the grant, and it's nice to get some money to have the research done, but they also need to engage in this idea of being part of a developmental program, connecting with the other fellows in other parts of the world, and particularly connecting with F1 and what that might be able to bring into their research and approach. Yeah, can can you share some of the um, some of the impacts that have been made by these connections with F1 and with previous fellows? Yeah, so working with McLaren without going into too much detail. So McLaren or well, all the Formula One teams do this. They all have lots of sensors on the the car and indeed on the the driver in the car. So they have a lot of sort of tech around that and indeed that how to analyse the massive amounts of data that come in from you having lots of sensors on an, an object or a person. So there are a couple of different applications coming out of that potentially for us. One is potentially using that sensor technology with people with dementia to be able to track them day to day and what they're doing and what their activity levels are like. I think you mentioned a Fitbit earlier. So that kind of stuff, but a bit more mm -hmm. and then analyzing that because then you can get a much better sense as a clinician of what's going on with that person than you get when you just meet them periodically one-on-one -on -one. so that's a, an interesting application then there's all that machine learning artificial intelligence stuff which can be applied to just about anything and we heard Andrew earlier mention that machine learning might be part of his work so it might be that connection with Formula One will give him access to different techniques than you might otherwise have access to. So this idea of the cross-fertilisation there. Um, so those are a couple of examples we've got kind of in the ether already. Then the other area is actually partly how we're doing this 
as part of our vision, which is to inject Formula One attitude into dementia research. So when we started looking at that early on with our first uh, cohort of fellows, we were aided by a professor from Cranfield University, Mark Jenkins, who's made a study of what makes for successful Formula One teams. So we know that sometimes you know, the same team can be successful one year and less successful the next, and they kind of each have their eras of, of pride and success. And he's made a study of that and also how that uh, information can then be applied for other organisations to help them be successful. And as you might imagine, things like collaboration, communication and teamwork and leadership all come up uh, time and time again. So part of what we're putting together for the Race Against Dementia Fellows is a development program based on things that are done as best practice in Formula One. And what this ends up looking like is not dissimilar to what I would have called a high potential program in some of the larger organisations I've worked in uh, as a business psychologist. So how you take people who are relatively early in their career and you upskill them in things around personality-based self-awareness, how that then impacts on how your communication style, you have your preferred style, but other people have what they want to hear and how you flex your communication to influence people of the different audiences and stakeholders that you might need to work with. So that kind of thing. So we have this development program, which feels very familiar territory to me from my background for our Race Against Dementia Fellows. And we're implementing that in a way that again, is inspired by Formula One. Formula One is very famous for these quick learning cycles. You know, they're racing every couple of weeks and sometimes even more quickly than that um, in the sort of current regime. And they make changes to the cars between each race. So they have a very rapid learning cycle of we tried this, this is how it worked, this is what we're going to change, this is what we're going to do next time. And so within our own development program, we're doing that too. So we've tried out some stuff in the last year with our first cohort. Um, that is kind of continuing on, but based on their feedback, Andrew and Adekunle will experience some slightly different things, um, hopefully slightly better. And then next year, when we appoint our next uh, group of fellows, again, they will experience some slightly different things based on what we've learned so far. So this sort of constant learning piece uh, at a couple of different levels feels really exciting to me. Absolutely. Well, Penny, Andrew and Kunle, thank you so much for your time today and uh, good luck with the research and, and uh, the future. Thank, thank you very much. Ah, it's been a thank pleasure. You. Well, we hope you enjoyed this episode of the Age Care Enrichment Podcast, brought to you by Silver Adventures. Don't forget to subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you're listening. And if you're enjoying it, please leave us a review. We'd really appreciate it. If you're interested in finding out how immersive virtual reality experiences can enrich the lives of older adults, visit the Silver Adventures website today at www.silver, that's S-I-L-V-R, adventures.com.au. See you next week.